In this segment, we're going to talk about syntax. So we're moving from thinking about language as a sequentially structured object in terms of things like part of speech tag sequences or sequences of named entity chunks. And now we're going to think about it as a tree structured object. So the study of syntax is basically the study of word order and how words form sentences. Uh, and this is an old discipline of linguistics uh, that basically tries to explain why we're able to say certain things and not other things and why we view certain constructions as grammatical or correct and others as not grammatical. So from the perspective of NLP, why do we care about syntax? So there's several reasons. The first kind of calls back to some of the examples we saw early in the course where uh, we have to resolve ambiguities about whether things are, for example, nouns or verbs. Now that can be done at the part of speech tag layer, or sometimes it really needs to be resolved uh, syntactically at a higher level because it's about how things are kind of combining together. So we saw this example very early on, ban on nude dancing on governor's desk. And the question is, is the ban on the governor's desk or is the nude dancing on the governor's desk? And that's exactly what syntax is going to allow us to answer. Syntax is also going to be a gateway towards thinking about things like verb argument structures. So if we want to extract information out of text, one kind of shallow thing we, want to, we might be interested in looking at is just like, OK, what are the events going on? And who's doing what to whom? And in order to identify that, well, we could use like a whole bunch of regular expressions or something, but that doesn't necessarily scale. Instead, a syntactic parser is going to tell us, OK, here's a syntactic analysis of the sentence. Here's the verb. Here's the subject of that verb. Here's the object. Now you have a more direct view into what's going on. And finally, it just provides us a higher level of abstraction beyond words. Uh, so for something like machine translation, if we're translating from a language that's subject, verb, object, into a language that's verb, subject, object, or subject, object, verb, that, that a language that has fundamentally different word order, parsing can help us recognize and kind of canonicalize the representation between these languages rather than just seeing these big surface strings and not knowing what to do with them. So the place we're going to start in terms of syntactic formalisms is what's called constituency parsing. So this is just one parsing formalism out of many. There's many ways to diagram syntax. We're going to see another one, dependency parsing, a little bit later. Um, but this is one of the uh, most common ones in NLP. And so it's a natural starting point in terms of thinking about what these syntactic structures look like. So constituency trees give us a tree structured analysis of sentences. Uh, in terms of their constituents. And so uh, we see on the right here an example of a sentence with several different constituent types. So at the very top, we have sentence. Below that, we have NP, noun phrase, VP, verb phrase. Farther down, we have prepositional phrase, PP. And you know there's, there's kind of other types that show up in other trees as well. Uh, the bottom layer of these trees uh, always consists of part of speech tags. So the tags at the very bottom here are going to be exactly the same as the tags that we were dealing with in part of speech tagging. Throughout this, uh, you know, throughout the, these segments, the examples will primarily be in English. And what I'll say about constituency with respect to different languages is that there are a lot of languages that it does make sense for. There are some that it doesn't. In particular, there are languages that have much freer word order. You can kind of put things in different places. And the way you inflect the words, like kind of suffixes and things like that, tell you uh, the grammatical function of those words. So those words, it makes much less sense to use this kind of rigid tree structure. And the dependency grammars that we're going to talk about later are better at handling that. OK, let me show you a little bit of a more involved example just so you can see a little bit more of what's going on here. Um, so what do we have this sentence here? Uh, she told me that I would never amount to anything. We have a what's called sentential complement here, S bar. Um, she told me that something. That gives us a whole, there's a whole sentence actually kind of embedded inside this other sentence. So this kind of indicates the level of complexity that we might end up dealing with here when we can kind of recursively get whole sentences inside other sentences. Um, 
We have a few things that we haven't seen before. We have an adverbial phrase. Um, and we have here what's called a unary rule. Uh, we'll come back to these in a little bit, but the idea is that this is a rule that uh, only has one child. So the NP only has one child, which is PRP here, personal pronoun. Um, and finally, we have this ternary rule here. So these trees are not necessarily binary trees. Uh, the nodes can have any arity. Binary is fairly common, but uh, that's not a hard constraint. The other thing that this shows is that English is typically right branching, meaning that the tree doesn't look like some kind of balanced binary tree, but instead kind of goes off to the right in a, in a right branching fashion. Okay. Let's take a look at one more example, just to kind of understand uh, a little bit of the level of complexity here. So this whole uh, phrase here is going to end up being a noun phrase, a refund that the court estimated. Fundamentally, we're talking about a refund here. All right, so within that, we have a smaller noun phrase over a refund. I mean, I'm just going to draw this triangle to indicate that there's some other structure here that I'm not going to write out, like the part of speech tags and stuff like that. Um, so we're just going to use that to kind of ignore, um, ignore what's going on there. Um, and then under this noun phrase is, again, one of these s-bar things. Uh, and within that, we have an embedded sentence, s. And what's going on in that s is that we have uh, this, the court noun phrase, and we have a verb phrase, uh, and you know I'm not going to draw the structure here, but um, we have this star dash one thing that ends up being a noun phrase. And the question is, what's this star dash one doing? Well, so it turns out the way we think about this that is we label it in the following way. Um, we label it as this WHNP-1. Um, and what that tells us is that, that th this, this kind of that argument is the thing that the court is estimating. So this is something called co-indexation, where we are saying that, uh, OK, you know, the court has to estimate something. The court can't just estimate. So in reality, there's some kind of hidden word there that is being the object of the verb estimated. But what is that? Well, it, it kind of gets extracted here into this that. Um, I mean, what's being estimated really is the refund here. But this kind of structure here actually kind of breaks the tree structure assumption in that, you know, essentially what we've got going on is we have this edge here connecting these two parts of the tree. So these structures, as much as we talk about them as tree structures, really can be thought of as graph structures. We're not really going to talk about this level of complexity in parsing much more. Um, typically, this is pretty hard to deal with. Uh, and it's not necessarily clear what dealing with this correctly necessarily gives you from the perspective of downstream applications. But this kind of shows the level of depth that syntactic analysis can go to. Um, we, we, you know, we're not just kind of chunking up things into trees, but we're really thinking about, OK, what's going on with each of these arguments? How do they link up, et cetera? All right. So what's hard about parsing? So we've seen that these analyses can be complicated, but we don't necessarily know why this is going to be hard from the perspective of uh, an NLP system. So this is a classic example uh, of prepositional phrase attachment. So we have two analyses of the same sentence here. The children ate the cake with a spoon. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at these and try to decide which one, or rather, what meaning each of these corresponds to. And I'll give you a hint, which is that uh, on the right here, we have a noun phrase that corresponds to the cake with a spoon. And on the left, we don't have that. We instead have a verb phrase and a prepositional phrase, ate the cake with a spoon. OK, so the kind of kicker here is that uh, by changing the structure, we change how we are viewing what's going on with this cake and this spoon. On the left, we have 
with a spoon, the prepositional phrase, combining with ate the cake, a verb phrase. And so this eating event is happening with a spoon. On the right, we have a noun phrase, which is the cake with a spoon. And this is the same parse that we would have for the sentence, I ate the cake with some icing, uh, meaning that you know there's icing on the cake, right? So this indicates that the spoons are somehow like a property of the cake. I mean, this doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense, but you know, if it was like you had a little spoon made out of fondant sitting on the cake um, and you were eating the cake with a spoon as opposed to the you know, chocolate cake, um, you know, this, this might be something you would say. The key thing is even though we think that the one on the left is much more likely, it's much harder for NLP systems to have these same sorts of priors because they need to know about cakes and spoons in order to figure this out. So this is why even pretty good automatic systems are gonna have a hard time resolving ambiguities like this. All right, I'll show you a few other ambiguities. Uh, modifier scope. Um, we have two different parses here of plastic cup holder. Is it a holder for plastic cups on the left, or is it a holder that, or is it a holder for cups that is made out of plastic uh, on the right here? Uh, Complements. Uh, the students complained to the professor that they didn't understand. It, are they complaining to? Uh, you know, there's a professor that they do understand, and there's a, there's a professor that they don't understand, and they're complaining to the one professor and not the other, or do they have a complaint for the professor, and the complaint is that they don't understand. And then finally, coordination scope. So uh, the man picked up his hammer and saw. Uh, is he picking up a hammer and picking up a saw, or is he picking up a hammer and then seeing something? So. The kind of comparison here is if he picked up his hammer and swung, we would know that he's uh, picking up the hammer and doing something with it. But uh, yeah, so the, the ambiguity here is, is kind of where the and is attaching and it's tied up with this uh, ambiguity about saw. Okay, so the last thing we can kind of say about this constituency formalism is how do we know what constituents are? Like how did, how did linguists kind of decide what these units should be? Um, and the answer is that there are a bunch of so-called constituency tests that let us kind of reason through it. And I encourage you to think about these just from the standpoint of increasing your own understanding about why kind of this, these syntactic structures are the way they are. One is called substitution by proform. Um, and a proform is either something like a pronoun or just any kind of general way of abstracting a phrase away. So for example, if we said, they ate the cake with a spoon, the fact that we can replace the children with they indicates that the children is probably a meaningful unit here. Or we could say the children did so with a spoon. That indicates that this ate the cake is a meaningful phrase here. There's kind of other constructions like clefting. We could say it was with a spoon that the children ate the cake. The fact that we could extract this with a spoon piece tells us something. Um, and we can also think about this in terms of question answering. What did they eat? The cake. How? With a spoon. Again, it tells us uh, something about the structure of these different units. This is not always clear, and there are places where constituency starts to break down. So I don't want to portray this as too clean or the perfect formalism. She went to and bought food at the store. Um, if we said she went to the store and bought food at the store, that, that would be a kind of nicely formed constituency structure, but uh, you have this very weird thing where there's this preposition to that kind of really wants this argument, but they've been kind of bundled up with uh, and bought food at, and so the store is, is kind of doing double duty here. Um, and so understanding constituency in this case gets a little bit more complicated. So the general takeaway here is that this is a formalism that we can do syntactic analysis with. It looks like it's kind of identifying these tree structures over language, and uh, generally this is gonna enable us to do some interesting stuff going forward. That's the end of this segment.